Good evening, everyone. I am Brooke Lament. I'm the director here at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum, which is part of the National Archives and Records Administration, and it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight. And as always, thank you for your, your continued commitment to the Library and Museum, and also thanks to the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation for its continued support of programs such as this one. Before we continue, can you please ensure that your cell phones are turned on silent or off? And while you do that, I'm gonna mention a few of our upcoming programs and events. Firstly, I hope you had some time to enjoy our new exhibit, The President and the Cartoonist, on your way in. Um, we also have a program on Thursday morning at 11 a.m. Here, uh, the Miller Center is bringing us a revisiting the Ford presidency through uh, secret tapes uh, program. So we hope that you consider bring, you know, coming out for that one as well. On October 10th, we are going to have Reverend Robert Jones here to perform songs that healed a nation. And then on October 30th, Scott Kaufman will be here to discuss President Ford's legacy as we commemorate the 50th anniversary of this administration. Now, I have the privilege to introduce our speaker this evening. Ken Gormley is president and professor of law at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, where he previously served as dean of the law school. He joined Duquesne's faculty in 1994 after teaching at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law and engaging in private practice. His work has earned him a national reputation as a highly respected constitutional scholar. His six highly acclaimed books include Archibald Cox, Conscience of a Nation, the authorized biography of one of the leading lawyers and public servants of the 20th century and The Death of American Virtue, Clinton versus Starr, a New York Times bestseller chronicling the scandals that nearly destroyed the Clinton presidency. His most recent nonfiction book, American Presidents and the Constitution, A Living History, has received national acclaim and was recently released in a two volume paperback with a new chapter added on the Trump presidency and we're gonna be selling it this evening as well. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Gormley is gonna be available for to sign the books. Mr. Gormley has testified in the United States Senate three times, and he has done extensive work on Watergate and President Ford's pardon of Richard Nixon. He earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Pittsburgh and is a graduate of Harvard Law School. And before I turn it over, just want to make sure that everyone realizes we are opening this up in this evening to a question and answer period. There is a microphone at the back of the aud or auditorium, so when we are at that point for question and answer, please, if you have questions, please make your way to the mic at the back. Now, please join me in welcoming Ken Gormley. Thank you very much, Brooke, and good evening. I want to thank Brooke and Joel Westfall and Tara Brock hiding back in the, the, the um, little booth back there and all the folks at the Ford Library for the honor of being here tonight to discuss these historic events of 50 years ago. And I know uh, that this presidential library at his beloved alma mater meant a lot to President Ford, which makes it um, even doubly special. Uh, I've taught constitutional law for 30 years now. I'm a, the editor, as uh, Brooke mentioned, of a book called Presidents in the Constitution with a chapter on every president up to the Trump. And it's worth noting that Article 2 of the Constitution that sets out the powers of the presidency barely contains a 1,000 words. That's it. And so the framers of the Constitution clearly knew that they were creating an office that wasn't fully defined and had to be hashed out over time. And nowhere is that more true than with the pardon power contained in these scant words of Article 2, Section 2, that says only, and the president shall have the power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. That's it. Uh, as was mentioned, I had the privilege of testifying in the Senate, and one of the occasions was on the pardon power when President Clinton, some of you may remember, was uh, 
criticized for some of his then controversial pardons as he left office in 2001. And the matter of pardons has only become infinitely more messy in the years since Donald Trump occupied the White House. But we're going to jump back a half century to start this story at the beginning. Uh, when I give talks about Watergate in law school, uh, I have to give a lot of background because most of the students weren't born yet. Uh, so let's start by how many of you were alive when, uh, okay, great, this is the kind of audience I love. A couple of people here, there's a couple. Uh, but I have done a lot of work on this era in American history in, in large part, or at least to start because I uh, wrote the biography of Archibald Cox, uh, my law school professor at Harvard, the Watergate special prosecutor who became a hero for standing up to President Nixon in the Watergate crisis, subpoenaing those secret tape recordings that would prove or disprove Nixon's complicity in the Watergate cover-up. Uh, I went into that project, I can tell you, believing that President Ford's pardon of Nixon was a terrible thing, part of really a, a, a part of the grand Watergate cover-up. But after interviewing President Ford for the book, I was so struck by his passion in explaining the reasons for the pardon that I organized a program at Duquesne University in 1999 on the 25th anniversary of the pardon to explore the reasons for that controversial decision. And then more recently for the 40th anniversary, I participated in events one big one at the Ford Museum in Grand Rapids, uh, and another one here. Um, and so as we now reach the 50th anniversary, which was on Sunday, I think there are even more compelling reasons to step back and reevaluate that pardon uh, for multiple reasons. President Nixon's resignation from office took place on August 8th, 1974. Then the pardon took place a month later on September 8th. So we are truly marking and standing here at a moment of great significance in history that's largely misunderstood. And I do think that President Ford's pardon of Nixon has had some unexpected relevance in trying to think through and unravel some of the Trump criminal matters which face the country today, which I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A. But I thought we would begin today's event with a brief video that's compiled of network coverage from 50 years ago. So I invite you to sit back and be transported back to that news that shocked the world and turn into one of the most dramatic announcements in American history as the events of Watergate reached a surprise crescendo in September of 1974. So Tara, can we show the first video? This is a special report from CBS News. Nixon, a full, complete, and absolute pardon. Good evening, I'm Dan Rather. President Ford has granted Richard Nixon a, quote, full, free, and absolute pardon for all offenses the former president committed or may have committed while in office. Mr. Ford also has granted Nixon complete ownership of secretly made White House tape recordings for Nixon to do with as he pleases after a period of five years. The sequence of the day's surprise events began just before 8 a.m. Washington time as President Ford, without his family this time, came to church across Lafayette Square from the White House. On emerging from the church service, Mr. Ford was asked by reporters what he would be doing for the rest of the day. He replied, you will find out shortly. Three hours later in his White House office, this is what happened. I have learned already in this office that the difficult decisions always come to this desk. My customary policy is to try and get all the facts and to consider the opinions of my countrymen and to take counsel with my most valued friends. But these seldom agree, and in the end, the decision is mine. As we are a nation under God, so I am sworn to uphold our laws with the help of God. And I have sought such guidance and searched my own conscience with special diligence 
to determine the right thing for me to do with respect to my predecessor in this place, Richard Nixon, and his loyal wife and family. Theirs is an American tragedy in which we all, all have played a part. It could go on and on and on, or someone must write the end to it. I have concluded that only I can do that. And if I can, I must. Now, therefore, I, Gerald R. Ford, President of the United States, pursuant to the pardon power conferred upon me by Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution, have granted and by these presents do grant a full, free, and absolute pardon unto Richard Nixon for all offenses against the United States which he, Richard Nixon, has committed or may have committed or taken part in during the period from July 20, 1969 through August 9, 1974. Here is NBC News correspondent Douglas Kiker. Good evening. Article 2 of the Constitution of the United States of America gives the President the power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States. Today, in a move which caught just about everybody by surprise, President Ford used this constitutional provision to make the most controversial decision he has made since assuming office just one month ago tomorrow. The White House switchboard was flooded with phone calls all day today, and the White House said most of the calls were angry, heavy, and constant, and generally condemned the pardon. For more detail on the legalities involved in all this and how the pardon came about, here's NBC News correspondent Carl Stern. Carl. Two friends of President Ford worked out the arrangement, Benton Becker and White House counsel Philip Buchan. It started on Friday, August 30th, when Buchan was asked by the president to research a number of questions, including whether Mr. Nixon could be pardoned before trial and conviction. On September 2nd, Labor Day, Buchan conferred with Watergate Special Prosecutor Leon Jaworski. Jaworski said there were no new time bombs that had been discovered about Mr. Nixon. On September 4th, Jaworski submitted a formal memo including an opinion that it could take another year until Mr. Nixon would even be brought to trial. And that seemed to settle things for Mr. Ford, eager to avoid still another year of Watergate. The next day, he dispatched his special emissary, Becker, to meet in California with Mr. Nixon. And Friday and yesterday, details were settled on Mr. Nixon's statement of contrition and access to his tapes and papers. Today, Becker was back home in suburban Washington. What was Mr. Nixon's reaction? To the uh, pardon? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Nixon, uh, here, please. Do you think that the president in any way anticipated the uh, public reaction that he's receiving from this? Uh, not all of it is good by any means. Uh, we're told that the White House switchboard is flooded. We're told that Western Union has four times as many uh, telegrams as is normal on a Sunday. So we're absolutely certain, Doug. We also ought to point out that those telegrams and telephone calls are running, as you've indicated, very heavily against the decision of President Ford. I think that uh, Gerald Ford is a man who has very much his finger on the political pulse of the country. He may have misgaged this some, but he probably deliberately made the decision now when he was at the peak of his political popularity. Well, the honeymoon still was going on, not only with Congress and with the Democratic Party, but with the country as a whole. And if he were to let the decision slip any, if there was bound to be some attrition, at least, in his own personal standing. So if the time were to make it, it would probably be now from his own personal point of view. But I doubt very much it, that he expected the kind of avalanche of decision and reaction that has gone against him. So let's go back to that late summer of 1974 as Nixon is being engulfed in the Watergate scandal. And how, how do we get there? Um, as you probably remember, President Nixon had won a an overwhelming re-election victory in 1972, but now he was fighting for his life. Uh, these White House operatives had been uh, 
arrested uh, carrying out a burglary inside the Democratic National Committee headquarters in the Watergate Hotel, and now Nixon was implicated in covering it up and in offering to pay a million dollars in hush money to keep the perpetrators quiet. So when Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox was subpoenaed, was subpoenaed nine tape recordings that would prove or disprove Nixon's complicity in Watergate, Nixon just ultimately refused and fired Cox in what became the infamous Saturday Night Massacre. That caused a firestorm of protest to erupt, uh, forcing the appointment of a new special prosecutor, Leon Jaworski, who subpoenaed far more tapes uh, from Nixon's secret White House taping system. And meanwhile, if you remember, Nixon's vice president, Spiro T. Agnew, pleaded no low contender aid to tax evasion uh, after being caught accepting bribes in little white envelopes. Uh, he abruptly resigned and was replaced by then House Minority Leader Gerald R. Ford, a Republican stalwart who was preparing to retire at that time. And he was not a household name by any means. The final straw came for Nixon with the Supreme Court's decision in US v. Nixon during the summer of 1974 when they unanimously declared that the president had to turn over the Watergate tapes. And that led to the discovery of the, quote, smoking gun tape, which showed that Nixon had urged his chief of staff to halt the FBI investigation into the Watergate break-in, which was a clear obstruction of justice. Uh, and there was also, you may remember, this mysterious 18 and a half minute gap in one of the key tapes that uh, experts said was created by a deliberate erasure. So the drumbeat for impeachment grew louder, and the House Judiciary Committee, in a very sober bipartisan vote, approved three articles of impeachment. And so on August 8th, after members of President Nixon's own party visited him in the White House and told him they could no longer support him, a visibly shaken Nixon announced that he was resigning, and the next day at noon he saluted and flew off in a green helicopter, and Gerald R. Ford, who had been vice president for only 10 months, became president of the United States. So that's the context, and now you have to understand that Ford faced a crisis of his own. What do you do with this predecessor uh, in the White House? Ford had been a loyal Nixon supporter. Both he and Nixon had begun their careers in Congress together in 1948. Uh, Ford was ready to retire in 1973, and he's plucked out of obscurity uh, to become Nixon's vice president. And so now, and this is really important to understand, he's sitting in the Oval Office surrounded mainly by Nixon loyalists and that presented some real problems. So within days of taking office on August 9th, a journalist peppered Ford about his intentions. Was he going to pardon his predecessor, Richard Nixon? Uh, not exactly what Ford was looking forward to during his first week on the job. So on one hand, Ford knew it was crazy to even consider pardoning Nixon. Uh, the country had been torn apart by Watergate. By now, Nixon was perceived by a villain, even by many Republican leaders. One of uh, Ford's top advisors, Bob Hartman, told me that he advised Ford categorically, do not do this. If you decide to run for president in 1976, your chances will be shot to hell if you pardon Nixon. On the other hand, Ford had a very strong sense of what he should do here. He was a man, as you probably know, who grew up a very modest origins here in the Midwest. He was the adopted son of a paint and varnish salesman from Grand Rapids who put himself through college here at University of Michigan on a football scholarship. He was an MVP, Hall of Famer, and had attended law school at Yale only by coaching football. Um, he was known as a kind of honest, square-jawed, straight shooter in the House of Representatives for 25 years, highly respected. And now he had a problem because he believed, after talking 
to his wife, Betty Ford, and a few close advisors that pardoning Nixon was the only real solution to this mess. The country had been become obsessed with Watergate during this time. Uh, if Nixon was criminally prosecuted, Ford felt sure that A, the country would be dragged through the mud for two more years, more selfishly B, he'd never be able to attack his own policy priorities uh, as president. Um, and so that's where this story really begins, that Gerald Ford takes office with only one day's prior notice. He is surrounded by these Nixon people, uh, Chief of Staff General Alexander Haig, Attorney General William Saxby, who was incidentally Nixon's fifth Attorney General because they all kept resigning due to Watergate. Uh, and in California, Nixon had uh, his former press secretary, Ron Ziegler, who was acting as his handler from afar. And in the midst of this, and this is really important to understand, there is a big question of what is going to happen to President Nixon's records and tapes. These constitute key evidence in all of the Watergate trials of Nixon's co-conspirators in the White House that are still set to go forward in the months ahead. There are only a couple of people uh, surrounding President Ford who he can trust. One is uh, Bob Hartman, the chief speechwriter. Uh, Phil Buchan mentioned on the video, longtime friend and now counsel to the president. And the other person mentioned there, Benton Becker, who is a young guy who's a trusted young counsel to the president. Most of the people in this drama passed away decades ago, but one of them, Benton Becker, who President Ford trusted implicitly, just passed away in 2015, and I was privileged to work with Benton for over 10 years. Both of us felt it was really important to preserve this story for history. So he was a young lawyer who had done work for Ford, uh, on several congressional committees. Uh, Ford had been so impressed with him that he retained Becker to represent him during the, his confirmation hearings as vice president. And now, during his first month in the White House, Ford brings Becker into his inner circle. Uh, when I did a retrospective program for the 40th anniversary with Menton Becker at the Chautauqua Institution in New York, and then another one in Pittsburgh, and these turned out to be the last that Benton Becker did, sadly. He died of cancer shortly after that. But through his firsthand accounts, uh, we've been able to better understand this incredible sequence of events that shaped American history. And we also have a contemporaneous memo that I'm carrying around in my folder here that uh, Benton Becker wrote at that time in 1974 detailing these events, which had been buried here at the Ford Library for many years. But here's what we now know. Within 24 hours of Nixon leaving office, he picked up the phone and called his former chief of staff, now Ford's chief of staff, General Al Haig. And Nixon said, send those boxes out here. Uh, during the five years in the White House, Nixon had accumulated a huge collection of documents, records, uh, voice-activated tapes. In fact, there were 900 reels of tapes and literally thousands of boxes, so many that the Secret Service was afraid that the fourth floor of the executive office building was going to collapse <laughs> from the weight of these things. So Benton Becker was in the Oval Office during a briefing with President Ford as General Haig was ticking through a to-do list of items that they had to take care of. And one of the things he said as nonchalantly as, you know, ordering a sandwich or whatever is he said, oh yes, we're sending Nixon his papers. He wants them. And Ford's aides just stopped the conversation in their tracks and said, well, wait a minute, that's a, a big question. Who owns those records and tapes. Among other things, uh, as I mentioned, they were keenly aware that these were the key evidence in all of the Watergate potential trials going forward for the other co-defendants. So they were wary of letting these things out of their sight. Uh, Ford said, 
none of this material is going to be moved until the Justice Department gives me a legal opinion about who owns them. And so four days later, the same group met with William Saxby, uh, the Attorney General, and he, Saxby had assigned one of his young lawyers to research the topic and write an opinion letter. It turns out that DOJ lawyer was a young man, man named Antonin Scalia. <laughs> um, so the opinion concluded, not too surprisingly, that there was no definitive law on this, but by custom and practice, the materials belong to the president. Uh, and I gotta tell you, this isn't, that wasn't such a far-fetched conclusion. Some presidents had kept their papers. Uh, a few have sold, had sold them for money. Uh, Ulysses Grant did that while he was finishing his memoirs. Chester A. Arthur burned his papers before he died, which was a common practice during that time, early time in history. Um, so Saxby took the position that if Ford didn't send the records and tapes out to Nixon in California, he said, you'll be thumbing your nose at all former presidents. Um, Ford sat back in his chair and said to Becker, Benton, what do you think? And Becker said he paused and he replied, uh, Mr. President, it doesn't matter what other great things you may accomplish in the next three and a half years left in your term, if you send those records and tapes out to California, the only thing people will remember about you is that Jerry Ford committed the last act of the Watergate cover-up. Uh, Becker said you could have heard a pin drop in the room, and he thought to himself, that may be my last speech in the Oval <laughs> Office. Uh, but Ford was quiet for a minute, uh, and when Saxby tried to speak, he kind of waved him off, told him to be quiet, and he thought and finally said, those papers and tapes are staying here. They belong to the American people. I'm not giving them up. And from that point on, an animus developed between uh, the Nixon advisors and Ford and his team. Uh, it was several days later that Ford called Becker into his residence in the White House for a private conversation and told him, I'm thinking about pardoning Nixon. I need to know the legal ramifications. Becker said he was stunned. He almost fell over. He thought it was crazy, but it wasn't his decision. So he had to go find out how broad the presidential powers were to pardon under the Constitution and let Ford know what landmines might exist. For instance, could could uh, he pardon Nixon of crimes even before Nixon was convicted of anything? Did a pardon cover just federal crimes or also state crimes? And more broadly, what were the ramifications of a pardon? So what Becker discovered in his research was that the president's power was virtually unbounded. It applied only to federal crimes but otherwise, President Ford could pardon Nixon for any or all crimes that he did or may have committed, even without a conviction. And Nixon had resigned, don't forget, before he was impeached, so that provision about the impeachment didn't apply here. Uh, but the most significant thing that Becker discovered that he shared with only a couple of, of Ford and his, a couple of his closest advisors was this. There was a 1915 case called Burdick versus the United States from the time of the Woodrow Wilson administration. Uh, it had involved President Wilson, I don't want to go into all the details, but he was trying to force a New York newspaper editor to give up the identity of someone and force him to testify in a grand jury. And when the editor showed up at the grand jury, he took the fifth and Wilson to decide to outsmart him. So he called this guy Burdick back to the grand jury and had a pardon waiting for him. And his theory was, well, you have to testify now. How can you plead the fifth if I've just pardoned you for everything? And Burdick refused to accept the pardon. He said, wait a minute, this is gonna make me look guilty. I don't want to, and he took 
it all the way to the Supreme Court and they agreed with Burdick and they said a pardon carries with it an imputation of guilt and acceptance of a pardon is an admission of guilt. So Becker discussed these findings with Ford. Uh, he and the president's White House counsel then met secretly with uh, Leon Jaworski, the new special prosecutor, to see if Jaworski was going to publicly oppose the pardon. That would be problematic. And in fact, to their surprise, they learned Jaworski already had serious concerns uh, that, uh, about the fact that there was so much publicity over Watergate. You remember the televised hearings and everything? All that was without being sworn testimony or anything. You know. and, and so he was concerned it could take years to have a fair trial, if ever. So my research uh, revealed that Jaworski actually signaled his approval of the pardon, even though I know his, uh, his team, the special prosecutor team, and they would have gone berserk if they knew at that time that that's what he agreed to. So Ford made the decision to send Benton Becker out to California to meet, along with a gentleman, Herbert Jack Miller, who was Nixon's private attorney. Uh, he was a seasoned criminal defense lawyer. I knew Jack Miller. He was deputy attorney general of the criminal division in the John F. Kennedy administration. So he was no political hack. He was an excellent criminal lawyer. Um, and so Becker brought with him a draft deed of gift by which the records and tapes would go to the US government to hold them, allowing Nixon free access to them to write his memoirs and all of that. But Becker was also directed by Ford to explain, explain the legal ramifications of the Burdick case to Nixon and tell him that if a pardon was granted and he accepted it, this would constitute a legal admission of guilt. Ford said, I want you to sit down with Nixon face to face, walk through it to make sure he understands it. So Becker flew off in a government plane with Jack Miller headed for San Clemente, not knowing what was going to happen. And a lot of people have asked me over the years, why would President Ford send this young, you saw a picture of him, this young, untested lawyer to California to, uh, to negotiate one of the diciest deals in American political history. Well, he did it on purpose because the press corps would never know who this guy was <laughs> when he went through the gates of the compound at San Clemente. Uh, if they put two and two together, if he would have sent his other lawyer, uh, it could have blown the whole thing to bits. So Ford wanted complete secrecy, and he wanted to get three things out of the meeting. First, he wanted a deed of gift for the records and tapes. Second, he wanted some acknowledgment from Nixon in some form that he had acted incorrected and perhaps even illegally in the Watergate affair. And third, he wanted an express acknowledgment from Nixon that he understood that acceptance of a pardon was a legal admission of guilt, and Becker was selected as the best hope to accomplish those things. So the first two days, according to Becker's contemporaneous memo of these secret meetings, were a total bust. He never even saw Nixon. Instead, he dealt with his former press secretary, Ron Ziegler, and his att attorney, Jack Miller, who would go huddle for Nixon for a couple hours at a time and come back and say, well, President Nixon thinks the pardon is a good idea, but those other things, they, he has a problem with those, so let's save those for another time. Uh, Becker later learned, while he was in the air flying to California, that Alexander Haig called Nixon from the White House and said, don't agree to anything else, take the pardon, Ford's going to pardon you, don't cave in. So. Picture it, folks. Nixon's uh, inner circle inside the Ford White House was working to undercut and undermine President Ford. Becker found a secure phone that evening, and he spoke with President Ford, who was really upset. He was really angry. And Ford said to him, I'm willing to consider a pardon and take the political fallout, which could destroy my political future. And these Nixon people won't even budge on the things that I want. So he told Becker to give them one more day and said, yeah, if, 
it isn't going to ha happen now, it's not going to happen. So the next day, again, the Nixon team had little to offer. They gave a, a lukewarm little letter of acceptance from Nixon that was written in the third person and said something like, the White House staff did terrible things and they did not serve me well. Not even a hint of contrition. And Becker was livid at this, and so he stepped out and phoned for a government plane to take, is that President Nixon calling? <laughs> um, he, he, he calls for a, presi uh, presidential, for a government plane to take him back to the Washington the next morning. He figured the Nixon people were listening in on the oh, phone call. Yeah. And he now walked back into the room and he said, I've spoken to President Ford. These negotiations are over today. When I walk out of this door, any discussion of a pardon is going with me. And so don't come back to me or the White House after your client is indicted or convicted or in jail. If you don't agree to these terms now, that's it. That got their attention. Uh, Jack Miller vanished, came back an hour later with a signature on a deed of gift and a new statement from Nixon that used language that was much more conciliatory and said, I was wrong in not dealing with Watergate more forthrightly, particularly when it reached a judicial stage. And other language it wasn't an admission of criminal conduct, but it was an admission that he did things wrongly. Uh, so now it was time for Becker to meet face to face with Nixon to explain the legal consequences of accepting a pardon and the Burdick case. So he went in to meet with Nixon in this small, barren office. According to Becker's contemporaneous memo, he found Nixon to be, quote, nervous, almost frightened. He had an impression of a man sitting in front of him as one of freakish grotesqueness. He wrote, his arms and body were so thin and frail as to project an image of a head size disproportionate to a body. The famous Nixon jowls were exaggerated, the face highly wrinkled, the hair disheveled, and the posture and comportment all reminiscent of advanced age. Uh, he said Nixon looked 20 or 30 years older than his actual age of 61. Uh, Becker went through the legal ramifications and implications of the Burdick case carefully for nearly an hour. And at the conclusion, after shaking hands with the president, he walked outside, got into a car for the airport, and before he could close the door, Ron Ziegler came chasing after him. He said, wait, wait, the president wants you to come back. He wants to give you something. So Becker went back into the room, and this was the part when he told this story, it was just so incredible when he would relive it. But Becker said that Nixon said to him, I wanted to thank you. I've had a lot of bullies over the years, but at least you weren't a bully. And then Nixon pulled out a little white box and said, I would have liked to do more. But he looked around, and there, he's looking at the empty walls, well, kind of like these walls, uh, <laughs> with nothing on them. And he said, but they look, they took it all away from me. Uh, Becker thanked him, said to himself, I'm getting the hell out of here. <laughs> and after the car drove away, he opened the little box, and it was a little pair of cufflinks with the presidential seal, supposedly the last pair that Nixon had. Uh, those cufflinks are now in the Ford Museum in Grand Rapids, by the way. Um, that night, as soon as he got back to Washington, Becker met with President Ford at the White House, briefed him, uh, and that's when Ford decided to hold a press conference the next morning before noon. Uh, neither of them obviously slept much that night, and the next morning at 8.30 in the morning, which was 5.30 a.m. California time, Ron Ziegler called Becker from California and said, President Nixon changed his mind. He wants to go back to that original statement, the one that blamed everything on the staff. And so Becker said, that's fine. I'll let President Ford know so he can pre cancel the press conference. Uh, so Ziegler backed off immediately. So at exactly 11 o'clock AM Eastern time, President Ford sat behind his desk, as you saw on the Oval Office, and granted the pardon what you couldn't see is on the other side of that camera, Benton Becker was sitting there watching as that uh, was filmed. Um, 
And so I'd like to show you, we saw Tom Brokaw as a young man. I'm going to show you uh, a little clip that he did, uh, the iconic news anchor for C NBC, for those of you who don't know us. But when we did the event at the Ford Museum uh, 10 years ago, he, he uh, did this little interview for us. Uh, he covered the pardon extensively in Watergate. And so here he talks about his reflections from that incredible time. A Sunday morning. The social climate in Washington by then was very relaxed. You must remember all that we had been through in that city. In the fall of 1973, Spiro Agnew had been forced to resign. Then we had the long siege of Watergate, the Supreme Court decision, the tortured explanation by Richard Nixon, and ultimately his resignation. There was an enormous amount of relief not just in Washington, but across the country, and such goodwill for Gerald Ford, who seemed like a decent man who would always do the right thing. I was at a brunch at the home of the housing secretary, Carla Hills, when we began to hear that Gerald Ford was about to pardon Richard Nixon. It seemed like it was a signal that come from outer space, from some kind of an alien environment. But in fact, it was true. Tables were overturned, people were rushing to cars, trying to get to the office, trying to get to the White House to file the story to figure out what was going on. I ended up at the White House and the phones were ringing off the hook. It was instantly and enormously an unpopular decision. I've always believed that President Ford, an essentially decent man, had prepared the country in some fashion by saying, I'm going to ask President Nixon to acknowledge his wrongdoing, to find some way for him to say to the country, how wrong he was, because he had not done that. And then I'm going to consider a pardon, a kind of negotiation that would go on in any kind of a prosecution. But he didn't do that. He wanted to put it behind him as quickly as possible. That was part of the Gerald Ford instincts. And it served him well as a man, and it served him well, probably in the long run, as a politician, because he had no guile. There was no hidden agenda. He thought this was the right thing to do. At NBC, the calls came in and they were almost universally critical. The country thought the president should pay a higher price for all that he had put the nation through. And the final analysis, how will treat, history treat all of us? It's always hard to know. My own judgment is that Gerald Ford, his standing in history will be unsullied by his decision to pardon Richard Nixon. People will talk about it, but by and large, they'll find him as a very competent caretaker who found himself in the highest office of the land in the most unexpected circumstances. And Richard Nixon, could there be any greater punishment than to have to be the only president in American history who was forced to resign because of his illicit, illegal behavior in the Oval Office and beyond? That was torture for Richard Nixon. It will never ever be eased by a pardon, by a president, or by the rewriting of history. So we should keep that in mind as well. What I remember most of all, however, was that in Washington in those days, you woke up in the morning and had no idea what would happen next. And there was nothing more stunning than to hear that the President of the United States was about to pardon the former President of the United States. I'm Tom Brokaw, NBC News in New York. So I, I have to tell you that most Americans thought the pardon was the wrong decision at the time. Uh, it sent the wrong signal that powerful politicians were, uh, you know, quote, above the law and that ordinary citizens like you and I would be put in jail for these same offenses. And Ford understood that criticism, but he sincerely believed that pardoning Nixon was the best thing for the country, as he told me repeatedly when I first interviewed him in 1995. So let me tell you about that interview. I met with Ford in a hotel in New York City as part of my work on the Archibald Cox book. And as we talked, President Ford pulled out his wallet and took a little scrap of paper out of it, and he had had the citation of a court case, and it was this case of Burdick v. U.S. from 1915. He was still carrying it around all these years later. 
Uh, I taught constitutional law for a decade then, and I had never heard about this case. Uh, and he said that it stood for the proposition that acceptance of a pardon was a, an admission of guilt. Uh, and even though the press had overlooked this, and we really rarely heard about that in terms of the pardon, it was very much a part of his reason for making the decision. And that's why he said he sent Benton Becker to California to ex explain the ramifications to Nixon, kind of like giving him his Miranda rights. Uh, so in 1999, when I organized this program at Duquesne University, uh, President Nixon's lawyer, Herbert Jack Miller, uh, came and he acknowledged there, it was in the New York Times for the first time with permission of the Nixon family, that not only was this whole story accurate, but in fact, President Nixon at first tried not to accept the pardon. He fought with his lawyer. He didn't want to admit any guilt. Uh, and so it wasn't until his lawyer really, you know, read him the riot act that he finally uh, came to his senses. But so Ford felt that the country had gotten the most important thing it wanted, which was some, finally, uh, legal admission from, from Nixon of his guilt. And somehow that fact had largely never made it through to the public and still is largely not understood 50 years later. Um, by the way, the whole purpose of a reprieve or pardon in the Constitution, if you look at the history of it, is to allow moving on. You know, uh, Gerald Ford's book was A Time to Heal. Uh, President Lincoln used pardons to grant clemency to Native Americans and during the Civil War. Uh, Jimmy Carter used them to deal with uh, Vietnam draft dodgers. Uh, but in any event, uh, most of this story was not known at the time. And so uh, both, uh, you know, uh, both pieces of this were something that frustrated President Ford. And uh, the fact that there was this strong desire to preserve the records and tapes that was just totally lost on the American public because what Ford was concerned with is if they sent the tapes and everything out to California, they would probably go up in a big bonfire, which was probably true, incidentally. Uh, and so think about it. The only reason today we have this rich repository uh, of historical materials in this presidential library and others was that Ford brokered this deal to keep the papers in check. Congress then passed a law, the Presidential Records Act, uh, that governed future presidents, and that has kept all of these materials in the public domain. And uh, we were talking before we came in here over a sandwich that Ford told me he was very much concerned with Nixon's health. Uh, there were some serious, he was uh, uh, undergoing some serious medical issues with phlebitis. Uh, he visited him in the hospital, he was concerned. And so uh, lots of this wasn't known by the American public. The honeymoon did end, and the fact that his, uh, that Ford's press secretary, Gerald Terhorst, resigned in protest of the pardon made that the news, and there was never time to put the pieces back together and for uh, this to be explained. There wasn't, you know, 24-hour uh, news cycles at that point, and so there really was a lack of understanding of this by the public. Um, when we did the program 10 years ago, Steve Ford, uh, President Ford's son, uh, filmed a piece for me. You know, he was an actor, uh, was spent time on the uh, Presidential Foundation, but he did a little piece for me to explain what he remembered as a teenager when his dad stepped down for the presidency and they were dealing with the fallout for the pardon. So I thought I'd let you see a brief little excerpt of this. If I were to think of the strongest um, perception that I had during that time, it was probably the, the day that Nixon stepped away from the presidency. I think we all remember that moment on the, the South Lawn of the White House. Uh, Mom and Dad walking the Nixons out on the South Lawn of the White House as they went to the helicopter. And once that helicopter took off, uh, we were there. And you, you sort of have to think about it. When, when most new presidents come into office, there's a celebration. 
there's there's parties, there's galas, there's parades, but that's that's not what was going on on this day when Nixon stepped down and Dad took over the reins of the office. I remember having a conversation with Dad um, that really kind of explained the pardon to me and his thinking. He he talked about the idea of a a president is sometimes sort of like a, a father of a family. And things go wrong in that family and you know one of the children or somebody, you know, probably me most of the time, uh, gets out of line and there's some punishment or consequences for that mistake. And a father at that point has a choice. Either he can you know, have some grace or mercy or, or have the full punishment. And a father will make a choice because sometimes by implementing the, the full justice or punishment, that might divide a family. And a father makes a decision. Maybe he has grace and mercy in that case to, to keep the whole family together. And I think that idea, when he explained it to me, played into the, uh, to the reason why Dad um, uh, pardoned Richard Nixon. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, in my view, uh, Gerald Ford did what he truly believed was right, given all the information he had. And in the process, he made the single decision that would probably keep him from winning the presidential election in his own right in 1976. Uh, one of the stories that really hit home for me when I was working on this project was that Bob Hartman, who was Ford's closest advisor, told me that he and President Ford were sitting at a meeting when Ford was considering the pardon, and Hartman literally begged him, and he said, can't you at least wait two months till after the November elections? It will kill the Republicans in the 74 election, elections. It will do serious damage to you in 1976. And he said, Ford shook his head, and he said, if I decide to give Richard Nixon a pardon, it won't have anything to do with politics. Too many decisions have been made in this office recently based on politics. If I do it, I'm going to do it because I decided it was the right thing. Uh, hard to imagine many public officials doing that today, incidentally. Uh, and he did lose the 1976 election, as you know, by a small margin against Jimmy Carter. And the pardon of Nixon was certainly a factor that contributed to that. Um, I was fortunate to have a chance to interview President Ford on film in 1999 as part of that 25-year retrospective at Duquesne. While many of the key actors were still alive, he died in 2005 at the age of 93. So I thought it would be fitting to show that little video today. You may recognize I'm a little bit younger there. Uh, to hear what President Ford himself had to say about the pardon. Good afternoon, President Ford. My name is Professor Ken Gormley, and it's an honor to join you here in the very beautiful Gerald R. Ford Museum in Grand Rapids. As you know, today is the 25th anniversary of your controversial decision to pardon your predecessor in the White House, President Richard M. Nixon. And I have just a few questions as we look back on that event in history. The, the single issue that seemed to dwarf all others in the eyes of the American public after the pardon was did President Ford cut a deal with Richard Nixon in advance to pardon him? Can you answer that question directly, Mr. President? Was there a deal of any sort? I testified before the House Committee on Judiciary that there was no deal, period. I think those are my exact words. And I can assure you some 25 years later that there is absolutely no credibility to that allegation. The truth is, I was going to be president without any question of a doubt because President Nixon was either going to be uh, impeached and forced to resign, or he was going to resign on his own as he did. So I was going to become president, period, regardless of any uh, comments between him and myself. 
And now that you're able to look back on your presidency with the benefit of 25 years hindsight, I ask you this simple question. Would you pardon Richard M. Nixon again if you had it to do over? Well, based on some additional observations, testimony, etc., I think uh, today, if I had to go through the same process with more evidence, I would uh, certainly have executed a pardon on his behalf. There was no doubt when I did it back in September of 1974 that I was doing the right thing, regardless of what the press said, regardless of what many Americans said. It was absolutely, unequivocally, the right thing to do for the country. And you had to look at it from that point of view uh, to understand why I took the action that I did. And did we learn anything more recently from the exhausting and divisive Clinton scandal this past year? Did it shed any light on what the nation might have endured back in 1974 if President Nixon had not been pardoned, but rather subject to a full-blown criminal prosecution? Well, the Clinton difficulties, I think, illustrate that the uh, impeachment process is a very, very difficult one. You have to have action by the committees in the House. You have to have House action, which means a full-blown debate. You have to have a decision by the House of Representatives, and then the case has to go before the United States Senate on the actual question of conviction or otherwise. Now, uh, in the Nixon case, if there had been a, an impeachment vote by the House Committee on Judiciary, followed by a vote in the House of Representatives with all the debate and then subsequent action in the Senate, as there was in the Clinton case, it would have been a, an atmosphere in the United States that would have precluded the Congress and my White House from trying to solve the basic problems we had at home or internationally with the Cold War. So you're as comfortable as we sit here today with the decision as when you were when you sat in the Oval Office 25 years ago today and spoke into the television cameras and granted the pardon. No question about it. I'm even firmer in my conviction that I did the right thing for the country. And I'm pleased to see that recent polls uh, have indicated that more and more people in America today are agreeing with me than they did 25 years ago. That's the benefit of history, isn't it? Right. Well, thank you very much for sitting down with me today to discuss this historic event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, that, so that program that was shown at the program we did at Duquesne in 1999, and it was broadcast by C-SPAN shortly after that over a busy weekend. And I remember being in my office on Monday and my secretary buzzed in on the phone and said, there's a guy on the phone that says it's President Ford, should I hang up? <laughs> and I said, ah, put him, put him through. And it was President Ford. And he just thanked me and he expressed his appreciation because he felt that finally the public was getting the real story of why he did what he did. So one can certainly debate the wisdom and the timing of his decision to pardon Nixon. Uh, there were a lot of things weighing on him. As I mentioned, Nixon's health was a serious concern. The, you know, whether he could get a fair trial realistically was a concern. Um, but there is a lot more support today for the proposition that however awkwardly ex executed the pardon probably was the right thing to do for the country. Uh, and in fact, uh, before President Ford died, the John F. Kennedy Library bestowed on him its highest award, the Profiles in Courage Award, for his decision to pardon Nixon, uh, something that he told me was especially meaningful to him after all of those years of criticism. So can we draw 
lessons that have relevance to the recent spate of criminal problems that have entangled former President Trump. Uh, does this history from 50 years ago shed light on that? Uh, I think so, but I, again, I want to save that for our little Q&A session. But most immediately, I think what we can learn from the Ford pardon piece of history is that the essence of true leadership involves making decisions even when they run counter to the prevailing winds of public opinion, even when they re run counter to the advice of your top advisors. The true test of conscience comes when an individual faces giving up his or her career, uh, future, political future, to follow their own internal compass. And I believe the only way a person has the strength of character to do that is to spend one's whole life following a very detailed set of principles in every instance of making decisions, big or small, even when the spotlight of history isn't shining on them. Otherwise, it's impossible to ever be able to have the strength to stand up against the political and public pressure and make tough calls when the time comes. And I do believe Gerald R. Ford and Archibald Cox both made their mark as leaders and as public figures because they had those strong internal compasses to guide them and they drew on them at crucial, even lonely moments uh, when nobody else could help them. And I believe without that moral grounding, they never would have succeeded. But history does look favorably on people who exhibit courage and integrity. Uh, in the end, the moral compass that he had inside him was more valuable than polling or political expediency. And as we look back on the 50th anniversary now of Ford's pardon of Nixon as a nation, I do think it's worth reflecting on that for all of us who care about our system of laws and government, and especially for people in our law schools and great universities, including students here at President Ford's alma mater, of which he was so proud, uh, who will one day be the next generation of leaders. So thank you so much for the privilege of joining me tonight. evidence against uh, President uh, Ford or President Nixon? Um, that's a great question. It's kind of a trick question <laughs> because of course the political circumstances have all changed. Uh, I will say and you know I, I do want to talk a little bit about the Trump situation but I will say that uh, you know I've read the opinion from this past summer that received so much criticism. Uh, and for sure, that opinion pushed US v. Nixon further than it ever was. Uh, I, I don't really believe if you applied that case to President Nixon, he would have avoided uh, culpability. I really don't. You know, to a certain extent, that opinion is just stating the obvious when it comes to separation of powers. There were some pieces of it that I disagree with, but to say that official acts are covered by separation of powers and non-official acts are not is not earth shattering, quite honestly. That was true before they wrote that opinion. Uh, but if you applied that opinion to President Nixon's conduct at that time, I do think that uh, it would not have saved them. Thank you for that question. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the Burdick opinion and its, yeah. and its uh, conclusion that a pardon is an admission of guilt. Mm -hmm. Is that one of the reasons why the DOJ, DOJ does not accept Alfred pleas? Does not accept? Alfred pleas? Um, I, I don't... Uh, pretend to be a pardon attorney, so that, uh, I will tell you there are 
different types of pardons that trigger different considerations. Uh, but all I can tell you is, as a general rule, Burdick still is the applicable law. In fact, my presence in the Constitution book, one of the fun things is uh, I w wove into the Woodrow Wilson chapter the story of the Burdick case in 1915. So you see this guy, George Burdick, who refuses to take the pardon, and uh, the Supreme Court sides with him. And then you see how history ties together presidencies when we get to President Ford. So there are, there are some circumstances, I think, when that general proposition would not apply that are rather complicated legal uh, nuances. But in general, that holding still is the law. It says specifically that a pardon is an imputation of guilt, and therefore, when you accept a pardon, it is an admission of guilt. And when, uh, for instance, there was talk of President Trump pardoning himself during his presidency, which I don't think you can do for starters, uh, I wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post warning him and his lawyer to be careful because if he did that, it was a legal admission of guilt. Whether they read my article or not, I'm not sure, but he never pardoned himself. That's all I can tell you. Would you answer that question you said so much more articulately than I could about Trump and the relevance today? Yes. Thank you, because I would have anyhow. <laughs> uh, I thought long and hard about this before coming here and just wrote an op-ed in the Post Pittsburgh Post-Gazette on Sunday about it. Uh, I know some of you may be interested in getting home to watch the debate tonight, uh, but I do want to say a word about this because it's something we haven't thought about as a country, and I can tell you as a general proposition, I believe in being extremely deferential to presidents. I don't think, for instance, I didn't think Clinton's uh, uh, conduct was impeachable when people were accusing George W. Bush when there were no weapons of mass destruction of impeachable offenses. I commented that I thought that was inappropriate. And even in the first Trump impeachment, I wrote an op-ed arguing in favor, like President Ford and Carter, uh, very bravely during the Clinton impeachment, arguing that a censure resolution would be better than dragging us through an impeachment trial. However, I have to say that you know, when you, uh, having written a book about all the presidencies, I can tell you there is nothing remotely close in American history to what happened on January 6th, uh, you know, when President Trump became the first president in 228 years of unbroken succession to uh, refuse to acknowledge the results of the presidential election. And many of these, in my view, self-made presidential and post-presidential scandals have been caused by his pushing things so, so far, including with the classified documents uh, matter. And incidentally, you now know, can understand why that simply isn't an open question. I mean, you know, the argument by President Trump and his lawyers that these are my documents and I get to keep them, well, no, in fact, that's what President Ford accomplished. When the Presidential Records Act was passed, it made clear that these belong to the American people and there are criminal consequences for trying to take them. So, um, the, Regrettably, I believe there is going to be a day of reckoning that flows from all these criminal charges against uh, President Trump. If he loses in November, which there's a higher probability than there was two months ago, let's put it that way, at least, it may come sooner rather than later. But one way or the other, I think it's inevitable. And ironically, I was saying to these folks uh, when we were having our little dinner that one of the results of the exhausting Trump cases is that Richard Nixon actually looks better than before. Uh, well, think about it. For all of the bad things you can say about Richard Nixon, he understood how our system of government worked. He actually was a world-class lawyer, argued in the Supreme Court. 
He hated U.S. v. Nixon. He called this case a witch hunt himself. Uh, but he abided by it instantly when the Supreme Court handed down its decision. Uh, and when the smoking gun tapes were revealed and members of his party came to him, he didn't say, oh, those conversations are imaginary. This is all fake news. What did he do? He resigned and he left the presidency and dedicated the rest of his living days to trying to rehabilitate his reputation by writing books and by uh, be becoming a sort of elder statesman around the globe. And he did partially succeed in salvaging his presidential legacy. I looked recently and he, his ranking is you know, in the bottom maybe quarter, but he's not, way, he's not down there with Buchanan or anything. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so ironically, I was saying at dinner, historians 50 years from now may say, well, at least Nixon was no Donald Trump. Uh, but think about this. This is the most important thing that I can take away from it if you try to look at it with a historical lens. The only reason President Ford gave Richard Nixon that pardon was his acknowledgement of guilt. First, with his reluctant statement. You can read it. It's not perfect, but of course he was still subject to prosecution under state law, so his lawyers never would have allowed him to admit criminal guilt. But he, it, was, it was quite an admission for him. And second, by his grudging acceptance of the pardon, knowing it was a legal admission of guilt. And in the Trump cases, there has been no sign of remorse, acknowledgement of wrongdoing. And so the problem is that if President Trump loses this election, um, he really will hold his own fate in his hands. You heard Steve Ford talk movingly about his dad when he was an 18-year-old sitting down and talking to him about grace and mercy necessary in a family and uh, sometimes for a country. And a prerequisite to grace and mercy, when you think about it, is remorse and acknowledgement of some wrongdoing. Um, you know, the American public is remarkably forgiving. That's one of the things you see from this, as is our legal system, especially when it comes to former presidents. Uh, but what I think President Ford showed us 50 years ago was a sort of roadmap that a long national nightmare can come to an end, but part of it depends on the person accused of criminal conduct getting past their own darker impulses and acknowledging that something they did was actually wrong. And so the million dollar question is going to be whether former President Trump, whether it's you know soon or after he someday gets out of the White House again, whether he can do that or if he remains defiant and is hoist by his own petard. So what I would suggest, and I would ask uh, all of the folks here, including Tara is probably our best hope, uh, to organize another gathering here 50 years from now so we can <laughs> see how American history treats that one. Thank you all very much for a lovely evening. So I have uh, just this little gift for you, sir. Thank you very much for coming. It was an absolutely stimulating lecture. Just a couple of little small gifts from us at uh, the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library Museum. Uh, we hope you enjoy them. Uh, well, and so thank well, you very, very well, thank much. Thank you, Joel. But having talked about the Nixon scandals, I hope there aren't little white envelopes. No, with... there's no, no, no little white envelopes. So a couple of things I'd like to mention uh, in closing. Uh, first of all, to thank uh, Dr. Ken Gormley for coming here and giving an absolutely fantastic lecture. Uh, second of all, to let you know again, once again, we are back. We are here. We are in the building. Uh, and we thank you all very much for coming. And I want to let you know about two events we have going, uh, coming forward within the days ahead. Uh, on October 10th, uh, we, have, we have a wonderful, absolutely wonderful uh, uh, musical performance. One of, our, the, one of the first musical performances we had in a very long time. Uh, uh, Reverend, Reverend Jones uh, is going to come here and do song, political songs. 
famous political songs that, that are in our, in our history. Uh, he's going to have his guitar. He's a very, very famous blues and jazz singer in western and sorry in uh, eastern Michigan uh, and we hope you come and join us for that and then on October 30th uh, we're going to have Dr. Scott Kaufman who wrote uh, my my favorite book on Gerald Ford uh, when he wrote his biography called Ambition Pragmatism uh, and a political biography of Gerald R. Ford. No offense to Richard Norton Smith, but it's still my favorite book <laughs> on, on President Ford. Thank you very much for coming. We have uh, some nice things outside, some uh, refreshments for you, so please in, enjoy. And also, we have Dr. Ken Gormley outside signing his book. Thank you very much for coming.